this morning is the feast of unleavened bread on the Jewish calendar today. It's the day after Passover. Uh, Passover was yesterday. Palm Sunday, as we have today on our calendar, is, uh, is preceding Passover. And we're going to, I'm going to give you a little bit of history on that because there's some things I'm hoping to highlight for you this morning about the Passover lamb that is so important, I think, for us to understand that this prophetic picture that took place. Uh, I'm going to have you turn back to Exodus chapter 12 for a quick minute, and we're going to read a few verses here about the Passover lamb. Now, if you're not familiar with what the Passover is talking about, uh, the, the Jewish people are enslaved in Egypt. Uh, they are, they've been there about 400 years, and the plagues have been coming through Moses. God sends Moses. He tells Pharaoh, let my people go. Uh, Moses, or Pharaoh foolishly says, who is the Lord that I should let them go? So, uh, paraphrasing there, but that's what he says, who is the Lord? And um, very foolish thing to say. And so the plagues begin to be poured out on Egypt. And there's ten plagues. And the last of them is the, the death of the firstborn. And he's going to come through the whole land. And the firstborn of every person is going to die. Except for those who, when they take a lamb, uh, they kill it. And they put the blood on the doorposts and the lentils. Uh, if they do those things, and they follow the instructions given here in chapter 12, the angel of death will pass over them. And they will not be judged. So we're going to read that real quick, and then we're going to jump into Matthew 21. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him... And his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and on the lintel of the house where they eat it. Skip down to verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on whose house is where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. All right. He goes on and continues into the seven days of unleavened bread, explaining that there in the rest of chapter 12. We'll go over some of these things here in a little bit here in Matthew. Why do we want to talk about this within Passover when we're talking about Christ coming to Jerusalem because Jesus is coming during the Passover week that's when he is coming into Jerusalem uh, I believe that he entered this as this lamb was selected on the 10th of Nisan the first month the 10th and then the Passover was the 14th that's when he was killed I believe that this is this took place uh, for Christ that he entered into Jerusalem on the 10th presenting himself as the lamb of God and on the 14th was offered for the sins. There is some disagreement within uh, Bible teachers if he came, I think, on the 10th or the 9th. Uh, for me, it's clear enough from the, from the uh, examples we have back there in Exodus, I'm going, he came on the 10th because that was the day the lamb was selected. Um, it is typically thought that it was a Sunday, in fact, when Christ enters into Jerusalem. And it follows right after with other feasts. You have on the 14th of Nisan, you have the Passover. The 15th, you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But the Feast of Unleavened Bread starts on the 14th. It's kind of celebrated on the 15th uh, with, a, with a Sabbath rest following. 
uh, and then is celebrated for a week of the 21st, has another Sabbath rest. After this, the Sunday following a Sabbath is the Feast of First Fruits. And after that, also with that, is the, is the counting of the weeks, seven sevens, which takes you to Pentecost. Why are all those things significant? Uh, because Christ is the Passover lamb. He was sacrificed. He is without leaven, meaning he is, he is the bread. He is, the, he is fully man, but without sin. He is the first fruits, the resurrection that took place the day after the Sabbath is the resurrection. He is the first fruits of the resurrected from the dead. We'll show you that later. Uh, and then we see that the uh, Pentecost fulfilled seven weeks after his resurrection. And so Messianic uh, Jewish rabbis, some of them that I read and everything, they, they very clearly look and they go, the first four of, uh, there are seven Jewish feasts, annual feasts, Passover being the first one in the year. The first four are fulfilled then at the first coming of Christ. Uh, they continue, obviously, to look, or we continue to look for the other three in the second return of Christ. So these things are very uh, important, I believe, as we're getting into here. We're going to see a lot of things uh, within the, uh, from Matthew 21 on that are to deal with Christ being the Passover lamb. And that's the primary uh, way we're going to be looking at this this morning. So starting in verse 1. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitude who went before and those who followed cried out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. All right. Jesus was staying in Bethany just before this and goes to Bethpage, which is towards Jerusalem. It's not a very far distance from Jerusalem. Uh, again, this is most likely Sunday. I think there's some, uh, some scholars that would try to argue that this was potentially a, a, a Saturday or different dates. People will try to play with the days. I'm not really too worried about the specific day. Sunday makes sense um, to me, but I believe it was the 10th of Nisan. Uh, so whether that, uh, and if you, depending on how you look at different calendars and, and what year you think Christ was crucified, uh, that would depend if that's a Sunday or not. But it seems, uh, both by church tradition and different things, that this is, and, and calendars, that that's a Sunday. If Christ was crucified in 30 AD, then this would most certainly make sense um, that this was a Sunday. We also have comments from Mark, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, says uh, that there was essentially four days after the entry. Um, uh, Christ also in John went to Bethany, we know, six days before, which again would make sense to us if he got there on Friday, rested for the Sabbath, went in on Sunday. So I think that that fits very well, but some people do disagree. And if you don't want to dive into all the calendar stuff, you can. Uh, but prepare for a very long journey. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is a lot of debate when it gets to the specific date. And to me, it's very simple. He wrote in on the 10th of Nisan. Um, why? Because he is presenting himself as the Lamb of God. In Exodus, of course, we see that Lamb selected on the 10th. And as Jesus is also riding in Jerusalem on the donkey, he is very clearly also stating not only is he the, the sacrificial lamb, but that he is the promised Messiah. And so it is a statement that he is the promised one who was to come. 
uh, but also I believe that we're seeing that the people here are still looking for the, for the reigning king, not for this sacrificial lamb. During this time from the 10th to the 14th, and we will look at this this morning, we'll see that Jesus is tested and found to be without blemish. And that's what they were supposed to do on the 10th when they selected a lamb. Uh, they were supposed to inspect it and make sure it was without blemish. This lamb also was not supposed to have its bro bones broken, which we also know is significant in the sense that Christ had no bones broken. And we'll see, of course, that Christ is a superior sacrifice, not needing one lamb per person, but one lamb for the sins of the world. And he establishes his new um, covenant with communion on Passover. That's when he establishes communion. So I'm hoping to walk you through that this morning and uh, as we go through starting here in Matthew 21. So he says, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately they will send him, send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That is, uh, of course, fulfilling Zechariah 9.9, 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is come to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So we see that right there, that that is a direct fulfillment, that Christ, as he is riding that, is claiming that he is the Messiah. He is intentionally fulfilling this prophecy. This, uh, this colt, had never been ridden on before, this young donkey. That within itself, again, uh, shows us something unique of Christ because a normal donkey, if it had never been ridden on before, you take it out, you try to jump on it, it'll buck you off. And so we see within this that, the, that it uh, obviously also recognized that Christ um, was Lord over the animal kingdom as well and that it submitted to him. But he is declaring that he is the promised one as he rides in. And as he's riding in on this date, he's also showing that he is the Passover lamb. Verse 7 says, They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitude who went before and those followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All right, so they're spreading their clothes out. They're, they're putting out the tree branches. Uh, John tells us they were uh, putting out palm branches. And uh, these things are done historically for kings. We see in 2 Kings where the clothes are laid out. Uh, palm branches were also tied to one of the seven annual feasts of the Jews. But they were not tied to Passover they were uh, tied to the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles, the last of the seven feasts. That is generally referenced from a Jewish mindset to reference the Messianic kingdom. And so I think what you see within here is that these Jewish people, as they're seeing Christ come, they're, Hosanna means save now. Lord, save us, save us, son of David. They're recognizing, they're crying out from Psalm 118. Uh, recognizing that he is the, the promised one, but they're wanting his kingdom set up now. We see that throughout the Gospels of the Jews. They wanted the kingdom to come now. To deliver us from Rome, not deliver us from sin. And, uh, and I think that you even see that within the palm branches. They're, they're, they're thinking of the wrong occasion. Jesus is presenting himself as the Lamb of God. They're wanting the Lion of the tribe of Judah. They're wanting the reigning king. Come in and establish your kingdom now. We'll follow you. But they were not looking for a sacrifice for their sins. In verse 10. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from, prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. It was obviously a very impactful day. 
Uh, following on from this, Jesus will go out and clean out the temple again, drive out the money changers. Uh, all this again from this time, from the 10th is when he's entering Jerusalem, and by the 14th, uh, which is the Passover, is when he is crucified. Uh, again, I'll make a, a thing for clarity for, for people to understand. Some people believe he was crucified on the 15th, not the 14th. Uh, what, what is wrong with that? The 15th is an annual Sabbath. It's always a Sabbath. The 15th of Nisan is always a Sabbath that follows uh, Passover. So I don't think he was killed on the Sabbath. I think there would be a reference. I don't think they'd be rushing to get everything done before the Sabbath if it was the Sabbath. Uh, so I think he was killed on, on Pentecost on the 14th. There is still, uh, within that, as, as we're talking about those different dates, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were divided over when that should be celebrated, if it was on the eve of the 14th or on the eve of the 15th. And so even as we argue about some of these dates today, they've been arguing about it for thousands of years <laughs> before Christ even came. Uh, and so when was the right time? Uh, the, the time Christ came was the right time. What was the specific dates of that? When we get to heaven, I'll let you know. Uh, but for sure, by God's calendar, it was the, the 14th. And whether that was considered in, the, uh, in a Jewish calendar, remember, the day starts at sundown the day before. So when we talk about Christ having a Passover meal, if he celebrates it, what we call Wednesday night, that's Thursday on a Jewish calendar. If he is then crucified later that day, it is still Passover, uh, which he, he died, we know, about 3 p.m. Uh, a really strange thought, but yesterday was Passover. So yesterday, uh, 1991 years ago approximately, uh, Christ died at 3 p.m. Isn't that a strange thought? Um, and I just thought, wow, isn't that just amazing? It just passes by, and we hardly even take a moment to recognize the gift that was given. Well, what an amazing gift that was given that day. But I want to go on to look at the ways that Jesus here is examined, and we're going to look at that through Matthew, and that they begin to examine the Lamb of God. Is He without blemish, without spot? And so we'll skip down to verse 23. Now when He came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted Him as He was teaching and said, By what authority... Are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I, will also, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say for men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Earlier in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, Do not think I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Christ's authority could have easily been proven several different ways as it's challenged. But he points them to the prophetic word. He points them back to the prophets. All the prophets foretold the coming of Christ. Why is John the greatest? Because all the prophets talked about when the Christ would come, when the Christ would come, when the Savior comes, when the Messiah comes. Those are interchangeable terms. John announced that he is here. He is here. That is the privilege that John had. And obviously we know that John approved of his ministry because he called him the Lamb of God. And also John baptized Jesus. And so he, could, so he is essentially saying, the prophets testify of me. But they are refusing to accept it. And so he answers them in a way that they can't reply. And he confounds them. But what do we see here? That the high priest... And the Sanhedrin, that's the elders who are there with him, they are unable then to accuse him of being outside authority. And so they, they find nothing of which to find fault in him. 
he continues to be tested more in Matthew chapter 22. Again, I want to remind you, all this took place between the 10th and the 14th. There's, there's only a few days here in between, and, and most likely uh, even later than that, more like the 11th, uh, 12th, or 13th. But Matthew chapter 22, verse 15, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk, and they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and that you teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard these things, they marveled and left him and went their way. Amazing. And they come in with their flattery. Liars. <laughs> Why do you test me, he says, you hypocrites? All right, now let's, let's give a little background to this with the Pharisees and the Herodians. Your Pharisees did not like the Roman rule. They despised paying taxes to Caesar. They hated it. They didn't agree with it. The Herodians were different. They were in with the Roman government. Uh, they supported it. And so this was a hot topic item, and these are two groups that are very far apart normally, and they're not normally getting along like this. But they have this idea, let's go talk to Jesus, let's present this, because either you'll be able to attack him, or we'll be able to attack him. This is a modern day thing where they're going, hey, this group over here, they don't believe in face masks. And this group over here, they passionately believe in face masks. Let's grab a couple people from each, and let's go ask Jesus if you should wear a face mask. Because <laughs> either way, somebody's going to hate them. And that's what they're trying to do. And if that was asked to Jesus today, he would have a brilliant answer that would shock everybody and silence both sides just the same. Just as, just as he does here. But this is what they are trying to do. The, again, this is two, normally two groups who would not come together. This shows their, their animosity, their hate towards Christ. They are trying to catch him. They are testing him. But again, he answers with such wisdom that neither the people that believe in the face mask or the one that don't, the one that believe in the paying the taxes or the ones that don't, neither side is able to condemn him. So both sides, again, find no fault in him. Whose image and inscription is this? Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. What a wonderful wise answer skip down to verse or not skip down continue actually in just verse 23 the same day the sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and asked saying teacher moses said that if a man dies having no children his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother now there were with us seven brothers the first died after he had married and having no offspring left his wife to his brother likewise the second also and the third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead... Have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. You know, Jesus clearly taught about a future resurrection. And the Sadducees did not believe in a future resurrection. And so I believe this was one of their common arguments that they would use with the Pharisees who did believe in a resurrection and one that their rabbis could not answer. So who gets the wife in the end? Uh, it was Jewish law that if you died without, uh, uh, without a child that your brother was supposed to come in and provide an heir and marry the wife. 
And so they're going through these things, and, and they're asking, so whose wife will she be? And, of course, Jesus here informs them about the resurrection, but also that they're greatly mistaken in their, in their perception of what it would be like, even though these people don't believe in it. First, he reminds them God is the God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's, they're, they're, still, they're still living. And, uh, and then secondly, of course, he lets them know that there is no marriage in heaven. So again, there is nothing of which the Sadducees are able to accuse him. Verse 34. But when the Pharisees, Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. <laughs> At the Pharisees again. What is the greatest commandment? Love God. You know, it's an important thing for us as we're talking about this. Always remember this. After you're saved, the most important thing in life, love God. After you're saved, most important thing in life, love God. Why did God save you? Because he loves you. What does he want back from you? You to love him. Number one thing for a believer that they should be focusing on post-salvation is pursuing God himself, loving him. That's the greatest commandment. The second, he says, is love your neighbor as yourself. But with this answer, of course, he silences the Pharisees. He actually goes on to ask them a question uh, about a psalm where, where David uh, calls him Lord. And he says, how, if he's a son, how does he call him Lord? And, and it says, after that point, nobody dared question him anymore. They got embarrassed enough, in other words, as they kept asking him questions to try to make him look foolish or to try to show his imperfections, they continued to show him as more perfect. And so they're getting frustrated. None of their plans are working. I find it fascinating. I don't think they understood at all what they're doing. These are fallen men with bad intent. But as these fallen men are working within the plan of God, they are uh, checking the Passover lamb, and they're providing for us an account that says, yes, he is without blemish. He is without sin, and he is without doctrinal error. There is nothing which they can accuse him of. And this is being taught for us. Who were these different groups, again, that were testing him? I want to remind you that there are four groups with four different tests. There was the high priest with the Sanhedrin. That is the, the Jewish uh, leaders of the time. You had the Herodians, you had the Sadducees, and you had the Pharisees. All of them came and tested him in this week, and none of them could find fault in him. None of them could find sin in him. None of them could find error in what he taught. That's a phenomenal thing, and that's recorded for us. Actually, even Pilate, so we have a Gentile testimony says the same thing in Luke 23, verse 4. It says, So Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. Everyone that examined him testified that he was clean. There was nothing to accuse him of. The Passover lamb, then, is now ready to be sacrificed. He has been examined. He has been found to be without blemish. Flip forward to Matthew 26. We'll start there in verse 26. Now, Jesus is eating the Passover meal with his disciples. I think, again, that this is, this is what we would call Wednesday night, Thursday. Maybe it's Thursday night leading into Friday. I think it's Wednesday night going into Thursday. Um, at this point, that he's talking with his disciples and celebrating the Passover meal. Again, remember why I'm saying Wednesday night, our time, is the Jewish day starts at sundown. So Wednesday night at sundown is Thursday in a Jewish day, in a biblical day. That's what you have all the way back to Genesis, and the evening and the morning were the first day, the second day. That is when the day begins. Um, let's read here in verse 
26. As Jesus now is he's celebrating the Passover meal, and this is where he institutes the Lord's Supper. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So as they're eating the Passover meal, this bread uh, would have been common that it was there. And though the drink wasn't commanded, uh, from my understanding, or in the Old Testament, Jewish tradition says that that was common, that that would have, of course, been there as well, the wine. But this bread is unleavened. Though the Feast of Unleavened Bread began on the 15th, the removal of leaven began on the 14th. So all of this was unleavened. And Jesus takes this bread, and he says, Take, eat, this is my body. So he's using this. This is, this is symbolic, guys. This is uh, talking about me. And he's also now establishing for us what we, why we take communion, a superior thing to remember than the Passover. A greater thing is being done. This bread being without leaven reminds us of his humanity, that he was broken, and that he was sinless, and that he was without leaven. He says, take, eat, this is my body. When the Passover lamb was killed, they also were supposed to eat the lamb. They were supposed to partake of it, and we are supposed to partake of Christ. Verse 27 says, then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The Passover lamb, when it was slain, its, but, its blood was put on the doorposts and the lintel, and so that the judgment of God passed over those who were covered by the blood. Jesus now makes, of course, this superior offering, one that fulfills the Passover. Uh, again, I want to remind you, in Exodus, each family had to take its own lamb. Here, one lamb is provided for all people, but at the same time, each of us has to take hold of it by faith. Each of us has to take hold of it. But God provides this one lamb that is sufficient for the entire world. John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming toward him, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What lamb? The Passover lamb. Jesus here again says, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of of sins. This is so important for us to understand that blood is required for sin. Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no way of being made right for our sins without blood. And Christ here is instituting this thing of communion for us to remember what he did. Just as it's given in Exodus, they're given the instructions of the Passover before it happens. So now Christ is instituting communion as a remember, uh, for us to remember that he gave his body, and by his blood, if his blood covers us, we are saved. We deserve judgment, but Christ came that death might pass over. And that is an amazing gift that we've been given, that we might live with him for eternity, and he is literally fulfilling these things on the days that these things uh, were uh, on the days of the Passover, showing us the prophetic uh, picture that's given through the Exodus. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19 says this, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from, uh, tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Listen, Christ understood he was the Passover lamb. Peter understood it. Paul understood it. Christ is, is the fulfillment 
of this Passover lamb. And when he was nailed to the cross right before he died, if you recall, he cried out, It is finished. The lamb had now been slain. Now all who are covered by his dead, by his blood, by his blood, death will pass over. It is finished. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We can now be saved. Jesus, of course, does not stay dead. He rises uh, from the dead on the third day, conquering sin and death and becoming the first fruits of those who are risen from the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 22 say this. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Christ paid it all. So the question that still comes down to this morning then is, are you covered by the blood of the Lamb? Is there blood on the doorpost of your house? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Jesus said in John chapter 6, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent, placing your faith in Jesus Christ. It is certain that judgment's coming. We know that. God warned the people back in Egypt, and he warned the Jews. And I will remind you that there was no exceptions for the angel when, it, when he came over, when, the, when this last plague was coming through. It was from the royal house to the slave. Anyone not covered by the blood of the lamb will suffer the judgment. But those who are covered by the blood of the lamb, death will pass over. And that is what Christ has done for those who place their faith in him. Thank you, Lord, for that. There is none righteous, not one. None of us can clean, be clean enough uh, to, to be our own sacrifice. There is no other lamb without blemish. The Pharisees were way better than us, and their uh, sin was exposed by Christ in the ways that he answered them back in Matthew 22. We see their, their sinful hearts exposed throughout the Gospels. On the outside, he said, they're beautiful on the outside, but inside, they're full of dead men's bones. He said, they're like whitewashed tombs. The only way we can be saved is to be covered by the blood of the Lamb. So have you cried out this morning yet? Have you asked the Lord to cleanse you from your sin? Have you said, Lord, I believe in the sacrifice that you paid, that you came down to earth, that you did live without sin, that your body was offered in my place and your blood spilled in my place, that I might have everlasting life? Lord, I believe. Forgive me, Lord, of my sins. Lord, I want to follow you. Have you prayed that this morning? Have you asked that from your heart? Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Have you done that this morning? Have you confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus? Take advantage of his offer. This is an amazing gift that was given. He presented himself as the Lamb of God. He offered himself as the Lamb of God. Listen, he's coming again. And he will come as the conquering king. He will do away with sin and death. He will judge the world. He will redeem the righteous. Those who are paid for will live with him forever. But the ungodly, he will cast out into outer darkness. Be covered by the blood of the lamb. And for us that are covered by the blood of the lamb, rejoice. Rejoice. A sacrifice has been given. And this judgment of God, we have been spared. What an amazing gift that we've been given. And we should rejoice in it. I was thinking about it last night as it was Passover yesterday. And thinking, man, if, if, if you were one of the disciples, just hours ago, Christ died. And you're looking there. And the hopelessness and the hurt and the fear that was in their hearts. 
It was a long few days. But Christ walked out of the grave. He conquered sin and death. He is the first fruits of those who are resurrected. And we know that we will rise again because he rose from the dead. He conquered death. Other people came back to the dead. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But Lazarus died again. Jesus ascended into heaven. He never died again. He conquered sin and death. And we should rejoice in that. And I want to encourage you this week to reflect heavily on those things if you're a believer. Reflect going, man, Lord, thank you for the gift that you would come down, that you would live without sin, that you would pay for our, for our sins. And not only that, Lord, that you would give us prophetic word, things that are, that are so plain and simple to see, the things like riding in on a donkey. There are hundreds of prophecies about Christ. That is one of them, that he would work miracles, that he'd be without sin, that he'd be born of a virgin. The list goes on and on. His crucifixion. So many details. But also, Lord, that you would even say it through history, your prophetic word, through the Passover, that a lamb would be selected on this day, that it would be offered on this day. Whoever's covered by the blood, the angel of death will pass over. Thank you, Lord, for those things. And as we remember those things, uh, as we uh, take communion in the future, we're not taking it this morning. I also hope, though, that you reflect on those things. The blood of the new covenant. This, his blood was shed for me, and because he died, death passes over. Hallelujah. Amen? Lord, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that you gave. I thank you, Lord, for your prophetic word, Lord, that we can see exactly, Lord, the things that you would do before you even came. I thank you, Lord, for how you fulfilled them. I thank you for how you instruct us, Lord, to understand them. Lord, thank you for, for loving us so much that you would die in our place. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. Lord, grow us, Lord, in our awe of you. Grow us in our appreciation, Lord, for what you've done. Thank you, Lord, for paying for my sins. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen the body, Lord, that is here. Lord, that as, as we move forward through this week, Lord, that our hearts and our minds would be fixed on loving you, on gratitude for what you have done, for who you are. Lord, as, as John said when he saw you, behold the Lamb of God. Lord, that this week, that it from our hearts, Lord, Lord, may we behold you with awe. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.